Hello, everyone. My name is Joe Custer. I'm back again to introduce the next sections to esteemed presenters. Uh, first, we have in this order, we have Kevin Ashley, professor of law at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. He's going to be teaching or speaking to teaching applied legal analytics and AI in law school. And then we have Emily M. Janowski Helan, Associate Professor, Director of the Law Library and Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Institutional Excellence, who's going to be speaking to teaching cybersecurity, internet privacy in law school. Uh, Kevin, take it away. Thank you, Joe. I'm sharing my screen now. I hope everyone can see that. Yes. Very good. So the American Legal Academy recognizes the impact of AI on legal practice. The fraction of law schools that teaches law and AI appears to be increasing, but it's still well below 50%. My colleagues and I have developed a course entitled Applied Legal Analytics and AI and taught it for three years to mixed groups of law students and CS or computer engineering graduate students. In this past COVID-19 spring, we taught the course online to law students alone. The course features lessons and homework assignments that introduce students to applying data analytics and machine learning to legal problems culminating in final projects. Today, I'm going to very briefly introduce AI and law and legal text analytics and touch on our, on our answer to the question of how much programming to teach law students. Then I will provide a quick overview of the course and focus on how we use homework assignments and an annotation workshop to introduce students to these topics. Finally, I'll talk about the final projects and conclude. AI and law is a sub area of computer science where researchers build computational models of legal reasoning behaviors. Legal text analytics or text mining employs natural language processing, machine learning and other computational techniques automatically to extract meanings or semantics from archives of legal case decisions, contracts or statutes. Its three main techniques include machine learning from legal text collections, legal network diagrams, and legal question answering systems. Machine learning from legal text collections involves computer programs that use statistical means to induce or learn models from data with which they can then classify a document or predict an outcome for a new case. Legal network diagrams are graphs of the relations or links between objects, such as cited legal cases or statutes, concepts referred to by statutory provisions or communications links. And legal question answering systems search large text collections to locate documents, short phrases or sentences that directly match and answer a user's question. We do not think that coding for lawyers is the right focus. Instead, we engage students with computer code enough to enable them to understand how the technologies work and how to evaluate them in the context of experiments with legal data. We step law students through incremental programming exercises with Python notebooks where they implement Python code design empirical evaluations, run experiments, obtain results, 
and engage in error analysis to see what programs missed and why. And then we organize teams of law students, and if we have them, technical students, to work on final projects where they apply these steps. Incidentally, I put a link to the materials in the chat. We want to apprise students of the problem of reliance. This, after all, is an odd technology. As Harry Serden put it, machine learning yields intelligent results without intelligence. Legal professionals are facing the need to rely on tools that draw inferences from textual data, but not necessarily based on what the text means. What's more, machine learning frequently cannot explain predictions and results in terms that lawyers can understand. And despite industry's extraordinary, extraordinary claims, the new text analytic legal tools cannot read like lawyers can. We aim to help students learn how the legal inferences are generated and how machine learning can be evaluated. Murphy and Pierce summed it up this way. Lawyers will not need to code, but they will need to understand how to apply and evaluate new, uh, new methodologies powered by AI. Once AI becomes central to the provision of legal services, it will have to become central to legal education. We also want to prepare students to work in the kinds of multidisciplinary team interactions that are so important in legal tech. We divide the course into three parts, artificial intelligence and law, applying text analytics to legal texts and text analytic legal practice tools and effects. The hands-on work of engaging students with legal text data, with Python programming and running machine learning models and NLP tools takes place in part two. The sessions in dark blue expose students to AI and law concepts, tools, and research projects. Homework one provides an experience with using text analytic tools for legal research. The hands-on sessions illustrated in the light blue color appear in the middle of the semester. Homeworks two through four present incremental exercises in Python programming and applying machine learning and natural language processing to legal text data. Notice also that there are three final project section sessions in green, one in early March to introduce and explain the final project requirement and set up teams, a second a couple of weeks later when each team proposes their project, and a third at the end of the course when students report on their projects. Between the second and third final project sessions, invited speakers lecture about how the text anal analytic tools are being applied in legal practice. We will reduce the readings and do not assign homeworks in this last third of the course to enable students to work on their final projects. Chapters excerpted from my 2017 book provide the bulk of the readings in part one. Part two is introductions to machine learning and natural language processing and the accompanying homeworks two through four involve a case study based on a 2019 research paper on retrieving case sentences that explain statutory terms. For each chapter or article, students are asked to submit one page abstracts briefly summarizing the reading, reporting, three strengths of the work, three weaknesses, three questions for the author, and a brief statement of how the reading relates to the student's interests. We ask students to turn in the abstracts a day before class so that we can see what they understood and what they didn't understand, and that way we can better address their questions. For homework assignments, four homework assignments play a key role in the course. Homework one introduces the students to using a legal question answering system and provides non-law students an, an introduction to legal research and writing a legal memo. 
It's a short exercise in legal research and memo, memo writing. In a scenario, a veteran witnesses a fatal air crash on base, sinks into alcohol abuse, receives a general discharge, files a claim for PTSD disabilities, but the VA rejects the claims. Students prepare arguments for appealing the rejection to the Board of Veterans' Appeal. They use a tool, Luima Search, developed by my student, Matthias Grockmeyer, a basic text analytic legal question answering program to research questions regarding the relevant legal standards, effect of a general discharge, alcoholism, et cetera, and use the results in a memo. Here is an example of using Luima Search to research questions such as whether combat participation proves service connection. We provide the questions and the students use this legal question answering program to find the answers and supporting cases. The program ranks cases by responsiveness to the question, provides supporting facts from the case and a link to the full text. Homework two introduces students to Python programming by leading them through exercises with a spell checking program, Peter Norvig's Spelling Corrector. This simple program learns frequencies of words from a document corpus. Thus working with this program provides a nice segue to natural language processing and machine learning. It, the exercise helps students through the program's execution. By running the program in CoLab with selected inputs, they see the results and determine what works, how it works, and what doesn't work, because the program certainly is not perfect. I mentioned CoLab. Collaboratory, or CoLab for short, allows one to write and execute Python in one's browser. It requires no configuration, and provides free access to, to GPUs. Thus, students need not set up and maintain their own Python environments. The instructor uploads a file with the code, data, task, and instructions. Students download the file, follow the instructions, and upload the completed notebook for grading. Homework three introduces basic steps in a, in a supervised machine learning experiment. Get the data, load and explore the data, split data into training, validation, and test sets, represent the document texts as vectors, train the machine learning classifiers, and evaluate on, an, on, a value, on the validation set. Students apply three machine learning models, nearest neighbor, decision trees, and logistic regression. They learn and apply three metrics, precision, recall, and the F1 measure. They generate confusion matrices to see what the models get right or wrong, and they compare the three classifiers on the test set. Homework three introduces students to the tools and libraries in the Python programming environment for conducting experiments with machine learning and natural language processing. For example, students apply scikit-learn modules for logistic regression, training and test splits and k-fold cross-validation and ap applying various machine learning models. These tools greatly simplify applying machine learning to textual data. Although they do require students to wrangle the data to satisfy the tools required formatting. Homework four extends the work in homework three to include natural language, natural language processing steps, like lemmatizing the raw sentences, including parts of speech tags, representing the text in terms of uh, frequency features, and applying a random forest machine learning classifier. Basically, students create a text processing pipeline that they can then adapt to other tasks and contexts.
Supervised machine learning requires human annotated examples, so we also provide students with experience annotating case texts. They annotated human prepared summaries of Canadian cases in terms of three types in our legal argument triples type system. The major issues the court addressed in the case, the court's conclusion with respect to each issue, and a characterization of the court's reasons for teaching the conclusion. They employ the gloss annotation tool developed by my student Yarmir Savelka that makes annotation of texts as easy as highlighting. And we all know law students are very good highlighters. In 2020, the course comprised both law school students and computer science graduate students, and that led to some sophisticated final projects. One project even led to a publication. Using a transformer-based language model, the students developed a machine learning program that learned to identify which type of Fourth Amendment test for probable cause a court applied. But we had to be flexible in assigning final projects in 2021 because we did not have a mix of law school and computer science students. My colleague, Yaromir Savelka, designed a new kind of final project based on a well-known process model for developing scientific or engineering, pro or engineering projects. These included task-oriented, data-oriented, or evaluation-oriented projects. As it happened, the three teams in 2021 all performed data-oriented projects in which one identifies and extends an existing publicly available data, text data set that requires manual annotation. The teams annotated medical notes for relevance to malpractice or personal injury claims, trademark decisions for the scope and level of distinctiveness of the marks, and credit card agreements for legalese, abbreviations, and definitions. The third team did a particularly good job of computing inter-annotator agreement, which is a key requirement for successful machine learning. To conclude, we believe that law students can benefit from learning to design and conduct experiments with legal text data. Our course teaches students how to evaluate machine learning technologies, to understand the problem of reliance these technologies present and to participate in multidisciplinary interactions. The spring 2021 version of the course confirmed the utility of progressively extended collab notebook exercises in teaching law students. They learn hands-on how to, to obtain, explore, and prepare data with NLP features to train the machine learning models and to evaluate them. We also learned how to adjust final projects to skills of law students in the absence of computer science or computer engineering students by focusing on annotating data for legal tasks. And I'll just point out that I have uh, a set of references here to various materials, including in red, you'll see an article that we recently published describing the 2020 version of the course in detail. And with that, I'll conclude and turn it back over to you, Joe. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, I do have a question right now. I'm looking, okay. Um, we don't have any other questions, but I do have a question off the bat. I mean, with the pandemic and your ideas on that, uh, you know, terribly devastating, and we're not officially out of the water yet, but no. it has proven that society and even, even conservative organizations have made changes somewhat, I think, dramatic from what I've been reading, previously really thought perhaps not doable. Uh, in the area of DNI, uh, have you seen transformations um, to help organizations deal with this new future, whatever that is? Uh, 
we've been improvising and some of the improvisations I think have worked better than others. And uh, the faculty is uh, sort of gearing up to share the, the things that they've learned that seem to work. One uh, activity that I used in this course and also in my intellectual property course is um, I do pre-record lectures, um, but I make them 20 or 30 minutes shorter than the time period for the course. And I provide a list of discussion questions uh, in advance. And then at the regular time of the course, uh, they don't see the lecture, hopefully they've viewed the lecture in advance, but we just focus on having a discussion. Uh, and they know what's coming because I focus them on particular questions of interest. And I find that uh, they're prepared and that the discussions were livelier than I experienced even uh, in the classroom. Uh, so it was uh, a plus from that point of view. I'm a lousy person at remembering names and it's uh, nice to see names with faces. So, so it worked uh, that well from that point of view. And uh, uh, the, the um, end of the year uh, comments from the students seem to suggest that it worked well. It's key, I think, though, to make sure you don't give them more work than they're otherwise scheduled for. So you have to uh, cut short the lectures a bit to make room for the discussion. Well, that sounds very effective. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Now, a question and answer, a question has uh, popped up. Okay, um, this comes from uh, Bill Sparrows. Professor Ashley's introduction in syllabus frames AI in aspiration terms. What does an AI application purport to do? Uh, you might want to get your pencil out because there's several parts to this. What does an AI application purport to do? In other words, vendors puffery. How can students understand how to delineate such a system's detailed capabilities in engineering terms? For example, what does it do in what environment, e.g. data sources, query precision, query precision, user protocols, quality assurance steps, staffing requirements? <laughs> does it do it? And what cannot be done? Uh, well, I think the uh, questioner has a, a, a healthy skeptical sense of the claims of the industry. And uh, I, I think it's important that we educate our students to understand that indeed uh, much of these claims are puffery. Uh, the tools extract information from text and some of it is extraordinarily useful. I mean, the transformation and automated contract analysis since I was practicing at White and Case, you know, back in the eighties is just phenomenal, but they don't read. And it's important that law students understand that. Uh, in fact, I find it reassuring uh, in, in view of the claims that uh, AI is putting lawyers out of work. I mean, who wants to hire an illiterate attorney? That's what these programs are. Nevertheless, one can evaluate them as I think the questioner's uh, detailed question indicates. And we have to give students an appreciation of how to evaluate them, how to set up these experiments, what the metrics mean, like precision and recall and the F1 measure and uh, ranking effectiveness and so forth. And uh, that a course like, that, like this is uh, designed to do that. So I agree with the skepticism and I try to prepare students for it. Very good. Um... Okay, are there any other questions before we turn it over to Emily? Okay, well, think of those questions and uh, perhaps you can bring in them up later in this session. All right, uh, next we have uh, Emily M. Gen you know, I don't know, Emily, am I pronouncing your second part of your hyphenated name? I never say it because I know you well because I think I'm gonna get it wrong. How is it pronounced? It's Halen, like Van Halen. Okay, <laughs> I said Helen, I think, but I'll never forget it now. <laughs> okay, uh, we have Emily M. Janowski Halen, 
Associate Professor, Director of the Law Library and Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Institutional Excellent. She's gonna tell us about teaching cybersecurity, internet privacy in law school. Take it away. All right, thanks, Joe. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna start out by talking about internet privacy separately from cybersecurity, even though how it developed at, um, in my teaching, they were sort of taught together and how I have learned more about uh, privacy and security has actually been at law firms, um, at CLE presentations where the two things are, are intermingled. Um, so this has sort of morphed um, from two classes that um, we used to teach, or we still teach at University of Akron. We teach the technology and law class, which is a three credit course, which has privacy modules uh, in it. And then now a social media law class, which is the majority of it is privacy. Um, so we're now looking at, can we just develop an internet privacy course? Because the students are telling us, you know, we're talking about social media law, um, but the majority of the content in the social media law class has um, really morphed into a privacy discussion uh, and a security discussion. And then we also have a three credit standalone cybersecurity course uh, at the University of Akron, which is taught by our director of our intellectual property center, um, but then we also have cybersecurity modules in these two classes. So I'm just going to give you a general overview of how uh, we teach privacy and we teach social media privacy and um, data security at the University of Akron. So um, in the technology and law and social media law classes, we do have internet privacy and data security modules. Um, the, what I've learned from going to presentations at law firms recently and at some of the big businesses like Gojo in our area is that law firms and businesses are really looking at the security side, um, that that's the business centric um, side. And then um, the privacy side is consumer centric. So businesses uh, like Gojo, who uh, makes Purell, um, are looking at the privacy and security from a consumer perspective and then also from the business centric perspective. So that's kind of how we've tried to teach uh, the course to our students. Um, the attorneys that work for Gojo told us this is what you need to teach your students. Um, and then we met with some attorneys who are certified privacy professionals who told us um, some things that our students should know when they go out into practice, even if they're not practicing um, exclusively in cybersecurity or privacy. So in the privacy modules, we do tend to focus on the um, federal laws and state laws. So we look at the uh, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. We look at HIPAA. We look at FERPA. We look at the Graham-Leach-Bliley uh, Act. We um, read the California Online Privacy Protection Act. We actually start uh, with the California Online um, Privacy Protection Act from 2003, which was um, about commercial websites, including privacy policies. We um, talk about the do not track signals that came out in 2003. So a little bit of history of privacy on the internet back in the early 2000s. We talk about other state legislation. Um, we talk about publicity laws. One of the big ones um, we talk about is the LeBron James right of publicity, obviously, because we're in Akron, um, where he um, there was a company using his uh, likeness and um, in a tweet. And we read that case um, for students just to give them context of what right of publicity means. Um, we look at other state laws like Nebraska, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Massachusetts. We focus on the Fourth Amendment and the First Amendment. And this is all in you know, a, a privacy module in these two classes. So it's sort of exploded into we could teach an entire class on internet privacy. So that's what we're working on um, now is how do we teach an entire class on internet privacy? Um, and really, uh, the class is designed to have the students read these laws, look at the state laws versus the federal laws, are there private right of actions under these privacy laws? Because for example, under FERPA, right, there's no private right of action. Um, so if you work in an educational institution, you might hear about FERPA a lot, but people aren't really afraid of 
of FERPA because of the no uh, right of uh, private action. So we talk about First Amendment and Fourth Amendment implications. Um, and, and we really get into the nitty gritty of the California Online Privacy Protection Act, which um, because it has the most teeth, um, there are regulations that go along with that. We talk about that law because it's consumer centric and how um, consumers can request information um, collected on them from commercial websites. You can't sell uh, consumer information under that law. Businesses have to delete consumer data upon request, um, and there can't be any retaliation. And we've talked to the um, companies in this area like Gojo who do business in California and how they're monitoring their, um, their use of this um, of their commercial websites in California versus Ohio, right, which doesn't have um, as as big of privacy protections as California does. So monitoring all 50 states plus um, international, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute because we talk about international in our privacy uh, modules. But um, how do they do that, right? How do, and, and Gojo actually has a team of uh, privacy, internet privacy attorneys looking at, you know, are they being compliant in California? Are they being compliant in Ohio? Are they being compliant in the international realm since Purell is an international product? Um, so we use those real world experiences. We bring in um, attorneys that practice privacy, internet privacy, and we have them talk about um, what do they do on a daily basis. So um, we also talk about the right to publicity. Um, we um, see if I can just go to this. Okay. Um, we talk about privacy torts. I mentioned the LeBron James case. Um, his lawyers threatened to sue Great Lakes Brewery if they didn't take down the Twitter post that said, um, it had a picture of LeBron James when he played for the Cavs. And it said, we thought last night was pretty rad. So we're doing a dollar off pints. Um, and they used a picture of LeBron James. Um, and in Ohio, we, there's a right to publicity law, Ohio Revised Code 2741. So we have the students look at that. And then we have them look at some tweets, at some Instagram posts, at some websites, and we have them look for violations of the uh, right to publicity laws. And it's interesting to actually find some. So um, that's where we have them look for material published or distributed. We have the reasonable person standard. We talk about um, representation for commercial gain or interfering with someone's individual commercial use of their rights. Um, and this summer, we've actually talked about the NCAA's new case where they're going to allow college athletes to brand themselves and whether there will be right to publicity law implications for that, right? So uh, we've talked about even at the University of Akron, if one of our basketball players sells uh, or brands himself with a local taco shop, right, with Barrio or something, um, and they start posting pictures of him, um, so what what happens if another taco shop does the same thing, right? Does that implicate the right to publicity laws? And are there privacy implications with that branding and the new NCAA rules? So um, it's a very timely topic, internet privacy, and things change, I would say, uh, weekly in the area. Uh, so we have students do blog posts. That's one of their uh, main assignments every week where they look for uh, podcasts or news, privacy news. We have them set up, um, alerts through Bloomberg or Westlaw or Lexis where they, um, or RSS feeds where they get information from the news and then they do a blog post based on what the current event and what the current privacy issue is. Um, we also have them do case comments on privacy cases. Uh, there are a lot of privacy torts cases. So we talk about um, First Amendment defenses for privacy cases. Uh, we talk about misappropriation of name and likeness public disclosure of private facts. Uh, we talk about false light and how that all um, plays, comes into play with First Amendment. And then the First Amendment defense, if it's newsworthy or artistic expression or satire. Um, so we go through a whole module on, on privacy torts. Um, we also talk about the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, um, which is uh, the under 13 websites like we look at the Webkins case um, where uh, Webkins was 
collecting information on children under 13 because webkins i don't know if you know what a webkin is but it's a little stuffed animal and it had a, a computer code on it and you could enter the computer code and then play a little game with your little stuffed animal online and it was targeted at children under 13 and they were collecting information on those children so um, it, it would violate the children's online privacy protection act without the parental approval um, so we have the students look for websites that are targeted uh, at children under 13 and we look for their privacy policies and then we in, a, in class we go through their privacy policy and we um, one of the standard is it has to be clear and understandable and it has to include parental approval before collection use or disclosure of a child's personal information that's under 13. And there has to be the confidentiality and then um, the FTC gets involved if um, there are violations. The kids safe harbor program provides the protections under um, under the FTC. So we look at the FTC and then we talk about what if a company violates its own privacy policy, what happens? You file a complaint with the FTC and we look at some of those actual complaints that have been filed. Um, so the Children's Online Pr Privacy Protection Act is a fun way to teach privacy um, because some of the websites that you that target children under 13 are, are, are interesting to look at. Um, the students always enjoy looking at the FTC complaints filed um, and then commenting on some of the, the um, commission's findings. So here's the FTC's uh, website. If you, we, we have the students go here, we talk about online advertising and marketing. We have them read about the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act um, and some of the disclosures that have to be on there. And then you can actually find complaints um, on there. And then the FTC also will sue, uh, or you can sue if a company violates their own private privacy policy. So one of the assignments we have students do is look at privacy policies and then write their own privacy policy for a fictitious company. So they can choose to write a privacy policy for a company that is targeting children under 13. We can, uh, some of them choose to write privacy policies for companies targeting people over 13. Um, and so that's another way that um, we have them look at the consumer and business centric side of, of privacy law. Um, we also talk about the EU internet privacy because um, a lot of US companies do business internationally and they have dealings in the EU and they have they will be subject to the internet privacy laws in the EU. So it kind of has a little international spin when we do our privacy modules. Um, I've done uh, presentations in our international law class just on EU internet privacy. Um, and I've been asked to speak in other uh, campus departments on international laws under privacy. And it's also a model of the US can use, um, hopefully, for internet privacy. So when we talk about EU privacy, uh, we talk about the EU directive on data privacy from 1995. So we do a historical look back where um, they, the EU said you have to pass national privacy laws, we have to create data protection authorities, um, you can't transfer EU citizen personal data to non-EU countries that don't meet the privacy standards, and it actually said US companies with subsidiaries in the EU were subject um, to the EU directive on data privacy if they promoted or sold advertising to EU inhabitants. Um, so there was a lot of um, uh, implications for the United States just from this in 1995 and uh, from this 1995 law and Google was actually found to have um, consistently processed and collected personal data of EU citizens. So if you Google, which is funny, the Spain case from the European Court of Justice, you can read about Google's um, processing and collecting of personal data for EU inhabitants, which was found to have violated the EU directive on data privacy. Um, we also go over the US and EU Privacy Shield uh, law from 2016, which protects uh, EU citizens in their data transfers. US companies have to self-certify compliance. And then um, in 2020, it was recently held to be inadequate under the Data Protection Commissioner versus Facebook Ireland case. 
Um, so we have the students look at that, how Facebook has international implications. It's mostly from our social media law class, but now it's going to be part of our, our privacy law class um, because Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok are all coming under fire um, in the EU. So um, especially because of the US laws regarding government surveillance. Um, so if you look at the, the US EU privacy shield, it's really interesting. There's a lot of cases coming out about it. You can do a lot of case comments in class and we've done blog post assignments, um, but the students love to comment on these cases dealing with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram because it's, it's timely and they're all using these social media um, products. Um, the right to be forgotten, that's um, if you Google the Spain case, the European Court of Justice, it's the first um, case we have the students read It interpreted the European Union 1995 data directive law um, and said search engine operators have to remove links to third party websites appearing in search results using a person's name in some circumstances, even if the information was true. Um, Things that we talk about with the right to be forgotten um, are the balance with free expression, free media, the requester's privacy, the nature of the information, the public's right to know, whether the data is no longer relevant. Um, and then we talk about the GDPR, obviously, the Global Data Protection Regulation. Um, it's European Union Regulation 2016-676, and it has the right to be forgotten in it. Um, and we talk about it in social media law, we talk about it in internet privacy, you, um, in the EU, they have a lot more privacy protections than we do in the United States, and a lot of companies do business in the EU, and so, um, one of the things the GDPR does is say you have to post privacy policies in clear and plain language, and if you've ever looked at privacy policies, um, some of them can be rather lengthy, um, but the, e the EU requires those policies to be clear and plain so that people can understand them and know what they're consenting to when they're using um, commercial websites. Under the GDPR, we talk about how you can only con collect personal data needed to provide the service the consumer is looking at. You can't sell consumer information without the consumer's permission. Customers have to have tools to opt out. Um, and then users can download and actually keep a copy of their data under the GDPR. So we have the students look at the difference between the GDPR and what's happening in the United States. So we have them compare and contrast the California on Online Privacy Protection Act. We have them look at the Massachusetts law, the Pennsylvania, um, some states have nothing. Um, and we have them look at some of our federal laws in relation to GDPR. And then we also bring in um, outside counsel from Gojo, and um, we've had someone from Buckingham come in and talk about how they how they monitor all of these privacy regulations for companies that do international um, business. And then we do look um, at monitoring federal legislation. So in the social media class, we were monitoring the Social Media Privacy Protection and Consumer Rights Act. Um, we were monitoring the proposed Algorithmic Justice and Online Platform Transparency Act. Um, so one of the things the students have to do during the class is monitor what's going on in Congress. Are there new bills being introduced on privacy? Where are these bills? And then in Lexis, if you go on, it will tell you the probability of the bill being uh, becoming law. Both of these had very low chances of passing. So we have the students set up alerts um, in Lexis or Westlaw and um, watch what happens in some of these privacy. So these are just two examples of some um, privacy bills that the students were watching last year when we taught these privacy modules, but they both had low probabilities um, of being becoming actual laws. I think I've mentioned this, but we have um, in our social media class, we have the students write a social media policy and then that directly relates to a company privacy policy. We have them analyze company privacy policies. Uh, we have them review cases and comment on privacy cases and write those as blog posts, which the students like because they're one page long and they're not lengthy. Um, and then they have a final research paper on um, either social media, internet privacy, social media privacy, internet privacy. Um, in the new class that we're developing, they will actually um, have more case comments, blog posts, and 
um, monitoring legislation and um, more commenting and less of a research paper because we found that's really more um, practical for them to monitor what's happening in the privacy realm um, in cases in legislation and commenting on it because that's what we're hearing that attorneys are doing. So that's privacy. Um, and then <laughs> we started teaching security and data security and cybersecurity could be its own class. Um, so we started teaching modules on data security. We decided that it was too big of a topic to just teach in, in one week, weekly module. Um, so we developed the cybersecurity class. We teach uh, ethics, we teach the legal implications of data security. Um, one of the things we found from our student feedback was that students don't even know what electronically stored information is and what their digital footprint actually looks like. I've also learned that from attorneys that they don't know what their digital footprint looks like. Um, just by talking to some attorneys in the Akron Bar Association, I've done CLEs for them. They don't realize everything that we produce electronically and that that electronically stored information um, is uh, should be secure. Um, so we do basic things like sending encrypted emails. We evaluate cloud service provider agreements. We review case law in cybersecurity. We adopted the blog post model in cybersecurity as well. Um, so we while we teach the the hardware and the software components of data security. We also teach um, the policy and the lawmaking components of cybersecurity. So we have them monitor podcasts. We have them read um, the Chesney um, article on SSRN because um, he was really the first person to start teaching cybersecurity in this area, I think, um, in his article which I will post um, in my materials, really it does a great job. It's, it's 120 pages, I think, um, but it does a great job of going through cybersecurity. Um, it appears short, um, but it's, if you break it down into weekly readings, it actually helps the students break down um, cybersecurity uh, and cybersecurity briefings and what's going on in, in um, cyber attacks and cyber warfare and hacking and legal hacking, um, which is a thing that students have a hard time grasping. Um, so while we teach cybersecurity on the um, legal implications, we talk about cyber attacks, black markets, economic espionage. Um, we also teach data security basics, right? So what do you, and this is just an example, um, you know, under the ethics rules, right? Um, what's your source? What's the source of our duty to keep data secure? Statute, we look at statutes and regulations. We look at ethics rules and opinions. We talk about industry standards, like something as simple as the credit card industry standard. Um, and uh, how do you take payment from a client? What about using Venmo and PayPal? Uh, we talk about that. Um, so, or we even talk about Apple Pay, right? Um, so we look at the statutes and regulations on the state level. Um, we look at the ethics rules under the model uh, rules of professional conduct. So reasonable efforts. We look at the ABA ethics opinions um, to really talk about reasonableness. And I have found that we spend a lot of time talking about what electronically stored information is with the students, because even though they are supposed to be the tech generation, they have no clue what they're, they're agreeing to when they click those click wrap terms and conditions on iTunes and Amazon and um, what they're using in the cloud. And they're not reading their service agreements, <laughs> which if you're using a cloud provider, you should really do. So we focus on that um, for cloud computing. We look at the payment card industry data security standards. Um, so industry standards for using firewalls. We I have um, our head of IT from the university come in and just talk about basic hardware security. Um, do you have your, and especially during the pandemic, it was interesting because uh, the I had the students read about was Alexa listening to your confidential uh, conversations, right? So you're working from home, you have a, a Echo device in your office, uh, or you have a Google Home, or you have a ring doorbell even, right, which is connected, um, is that 
is there a possibility that it could be listening to your confidential um, uh, conversations with clients if you were an attorney working from home, right? Um, so that they love, they love that, right? <laughs> they loved hearing about, should I unplug my Alexa? Um, should I turn off Siri on my iPhone, right? Um, because I know sometimes I'll say something that sounds like, hey, Siri, and she'll chime, pop up and say, you know, do you have a question? <laughs> um, and my daughter has an Alexa at home and she, she is very skilled. She's nine years old and she's very skilled at using Alexa, even to the point where she was ordering things on Amazon because I had forgotten to uncheck the box, right? Saying she could order things and, and LED light, unicorn lights showed up on our front porch, right? <laughs> so we were talking to students about how do you secure these home devices if you're an attorney working from home? Um, so I have our IT staff come in uh, because it's, it's practical and it's basic, but it's things that attorneys don't think about, especially working from home. So we talk about industry standards, firewalls, do you have to talk to about uh, talk with your clients about cybersecurity? Um, are you using a cloud service provider, and should you have your clients agree to use that cloud service provider for their personal information? Right, we look we have them look at actual cybersecurity agreements. Um, we have them look at cyber insurance uh, that you can purchase as an attorney because a lot of uh, cybersecurity issues are not covered by normal. Uh, malpractice insurance or attorney, ins uh, so cyber insurance is, is a thing now, we have them look at that. Um, and I mean, it, it, we talk about law firm data being a target, we look at ca real cases where people have been hacked um, because so many companies are being hacked, like the pipeline that was recently hacked, we talk about hacking, um, illegal hacking versus um, legal hacking um, and, and what would happen if you have a data breach at your law firm, you have you know a duty to disclose. You have to make sure that you've followed your data security plan. And just talking with local uh, law firms in the Akron Cleveland area, they have data security plans now in place um, that are supposed to cover these things. Now, during the pandemic, when everyone was working from home, that sort of blew up, right? Because you took your laptop home, you were connecting to your personal Wi-Fi. was your firewall on, were you using a virtual private network to connect to work? Um, were you using your cloud service provider? Um, so I think maybe more data security policies will be coming down the pipeline as we go back to work. Um, in person or as we stay virtual, because some, some attorneys are, are staying virtual, they found they don't need that brick and, brick and mortar office. Um, social engineering scams are huge. They're even bigger now. So we talk about social engineering scams and what happens when you have uh, someone in your office who clicks that phishing scam, even um, if it's not the attorney, but it's their um, paralegal, right? Or their office assistant or their extern, which has happened recently. Uh, malware from email on the web. How do you get hacked? What happens when you get hacked? Um, and then we talk about tips and tricks. And that's usually um, when I bring in actual IT personnel to talk about tips and tricks. Um, I have them write practical policies like a cybersecurity policy for their employees, a data security policy. Um, how, how do you um, maintain that hardware at home if you're going to have work from home or flexible work arrangements? Um, so we go through everything from physical security of your desktop, laptop, mobile phones to securing documents in the cloud service provider, email security. We talk about um, mobile security. So your, um, your cell phone, remote access, virtual private networks, how to set them up. Um, we show them open source software. We show them fee-based software. And we have some companies that have given us licenses to fee-based software so students can play with them. And um, we talk about secure disposal and then obviously cyber insurance. Uh, we also have a separate cyber um, security class that is more doctrinal in nature. Um, so this, this data security class is more practical. Um, so the students can take both. They can take the cyber security class that's more on a doctrinal level, substantive, um, and then this one that's more, more practical based. Um, so that is what we do at the University of Akron. I think I have like 15 minutes left maybe um, for questions. 
Um, we are adapting. I, I think these class, these two topics change so frequently that I feel like I'm changing my syllabus every, like in the middle of the semester, especially um, the cybersecurity, the data security topic. Uh, Emily, that was fantastic. Uh, you certainly cover a lot, and um, uh, I recognize uh, a lot of it, uh, but it gave me some ideas, too, and thank you very much for that. We have a question for you from uh, actually uh, from another of our esteemed um, presenters, and if I can get my chat back up, here it is, uh, and this is from uh, Kevin Ashley. Uh, your, your compatriot there. Um, your internet privacy course sounds great. Have you assembled your own readings for the course? Any plans to make them available publicly? Yeah, a true professor question uh, to another colleague. <laughs> yes, we do have um, readings. And it's mostly case law and, uh, and, and they change, right? Um, because privacy changes all the time. But yes, I would absolutely make those available. Sure. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, I'm happy about that too. Uh, maybe to all of uh, our, our, our group here, and we can send it out for you. And, uh, so anyway, um, and I have a question too. I really like your emphasis on regulations. Um, and uh, I, I speak to those too. And, you know, uh, the history of regulations, and you know, you mentioned the GDPR certainly is is uh, important. And you know, it's interesting that, as you would know, the Obama administration, right toward the end, tried to get their online privacy act passed. It passed the House, but it didn't pass the Senate. But it's interesting. GDPR actually had most of that in it already. <laughs> And like you said, uh, the tentacles of the EU go all over internationally. And, and our, the U.S. has been phenomenally hit by that because if you're international in any way, there's usually an EU aspect to that. Uh, but like you say, the GDPR in, in 2018, I was writing these down. You also mentioned the California Consumer Privacy Act. Uh, Brazil just passed an act, and, and there's also one coming from Asia. Um, and 70% of the globes, I wrote this down from a uh, trial jury, 70% of the global's GDP will have undergone digitization by next year, 2022. What, being uh, an expert in this area, what is your uh, thinking about this rise of regulations as data just, uh, you know, expands and, 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 you know, what are your, what, what's your assessment? I, I mean, I think the regulations are necessary to provide teeth to the legislation, right? Because I think California found out very quickly that just adopting the California Online Privacy Protection Act wasn't enough. They had to have regulations to enforce it. And, yeah. and then I think it's very difficult to enforce privacy regulations in general um, because it takes a lot of tracking. You know, you, under the GDPR, there are some notification laws. The US has notification laws, um, but to require companies to protect data and not sell consumer information in the United States is difficult. Uh, especially because, you know, people are, are very, people think that they are, they have a right to privacy in, like in our social media class, we talk about right to privacy, but you're posting on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, your daily breakfast, right? <laughs> and every move you make, you're checking in on every vacation. So I think in the United States, it's hard to pass these privacy laws and actually provide some teeth for them because people are so open about sharing. But I do think that um, US companies are finding it difficult to navigate all of these new privacy laws. It'd be great if um, they were more uniform and the US had one that was similar to GDPR or Brazil or Asia. Um, but I, I think everything that gets introduced slowly dies. Um, so. It's, it's a difficult realm to, to navigate. Right, right. Well, that's, that's the, I appreciate your thoughts on that. We do have some questions mounting up. Uh, one is from Rob Wiley, who asked you, 
any sources you recommend for A, getting up to speed and B, staying current in your area, Emily. And he also states, I joined late. Uh, so sorry if I missed this earlier. Yeah, I, I would be happy to provide you with the, the websites that I have RSS feeds to, um, if you're talking about internet privacy and then also cybersecurity, um, because there are some podcasts, um, the Chesney article on SSRN I can post as well for cybersecurity. Um, I tend to, I set up a Bloomberg, the privacy law um, weekly newsletter I get, um, which has like the Facebook cases on them when they come out. Um, and then I have Lexis and Westlaw alerts as well um, in the privacy law um, practice centers. Um, but yes, I will um, definitely send those out, send those to Joe and he can disseminate them. Great. Um, actually, I'm going to turn it over to uh, SJ, who I assigned to ask the questions. I, 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 I shouldn't be so eager to do that. So anyway, SJ, if you want to follow up with the other questions. Okay. Um, Susan Urban asked, uh, for all the previous present, pre presenters, if you are presenting the topics of e-discovery, AI, cybersecurity as a two-hour sessions in each two-hour sessions each in a single law practice tech course that covers all topics over the course of the semester, what would be the most important aspects of these to cover? Well, she may be, I don't know. She said the other session, uh, maybe she's talking to me. I'm not sure, but any one of the presenters can, can get on this. But uh, she may be addressing my law practice technology course where I did mention I cover e-discovery, cybersecurity, uh, AI, and blockchain. Uh, how do I cover all that? Probably very poorly. Uh, I have a lot of guests come in. The students love the class. It gets high. You know, it, it beats the mean for the law school teaching. Uh, they like what they get. But I make it known up front, Susan, that this is just getting your feet wet. Right. This is so you have a working knowledge, nothing more than that. And I tell them other places they can go and they can develop that knowledge. But um, but yeah, that, that's how I do it. Uh, not as well as it should be done if you had separate classes devoted to those. The next question is for Professor Janusky Halen. What kind of final assessment do you have for your course? Final project, paper or something else? In the, um, the privacy, it's a final research project, although we're looking at whether or not it should be sort of a, um, a patchwork of the privacy policy um, that we've been doing, because that turned out to, to be a huge project that students love doing, where they evaluated a privacy policy and then wrote their own privacy policy for a company or an organization. Um, and then for cybersecurity, we do uh, a data plan um, so the, the students have to write um, a data security plan for their law office or their company, or, or, and then they have to um, create a data security flow. So what happens in the area, if there's a breach, what's the notification? So it's basically a, a, an outline of, of what do you do if you have um, a cyber attack, if you have a hack, um, somebody loses their laptop, that kind of thing. Um, the students really like that because it's, it's more practical in nature. Are there any other questions, SJ? I don't see any other questions. Okay. Well, um, unless another one pops up uh, in the next couple minutes, we'll probably let you off early for lunch. Uh, or it sounds like lunch. It's not lunch. Teas, psych. Anyway, uh, it'll be a break. And we ask that you come back at 1130. I guess that 25 minutes would be probably enough for lunch for many of you. Um, so anyway, uh, actually, I have four after. Uh, so if there's nothing else, uh, we will uh, see you back at 1130 for the last session. OK. <laughs> All right. See ya. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Hello, welcome back to Ignite Legal Tech Imp uh, Innovation 2021, day hey, one. Joe, if you, I'm sorry, Joe, headphones, please. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry. Sometimes I have it so I can talk well without my headphones, but not now currently. Uh, so thanks again, Martin, for letting me know. Welcome back to Ignite Legal Tech Innovation 2021, day one, teaching tech. Um, the program, in my opinion, has gone very well up to this point, and it will continue to do so, knowing the two, uh, the next two professionals. Uh, so with that said, uh, the two I'm introducing right now, first is Heidi Kuhl, circuit librarian at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit in Chicago. Uh, before uh, Heidi got her esteemed position, she was a uh, professor of law and director of, and pardon me, um, Shapiro Law Li Memorial Law Library, okay, at Northern Illinois University School of Law. And... Um, See, Heidi will be talking about uh, teaching case practice management in law school. After Heidi, we have Roger Skullback, professor of law and associate dean of library and information services at the Richmond School of Law. And uh, Roger will be uh, covering teaching tech competency in law school. Uh, before we get going with our speakers, I do want to mention, which I failed to do this morning, uh, this program is, uh, has been sponsored and basically built by the Case Western Reserve Law Library um, and MALCO, the mid Ameris Association of Law School Consortium. Uh, I would be um, amiss if I didn't mention that. Uh, so, uh, Heidi. It's to you. Great. Thank you, Joe. And thank you to Case Western for um, coordinating this conference and to all my esteemed colleagues who spoke this morning. I really enjoyed those presentations. Um, and I'll probably refer to a couple of the comments here as I uh, frame some of my content on case management tools. Obviously, with the switch from academe to the court, um, I have a different lens now on educating um, new externs, new clerks. Uh, so I'll briefly refer to that experience. I started in February, um, and I also was teaching last fall, last summer, last spring. Um, when we were deep into the pandemic at that point. Um, so I think this conference is indeed timely because we were all wading through the accelerating change um, in this new digital age. Um, so thank you to Joe for all your work on this conference. I think it's a really nice way to share ideas um, because I'm still tweaking teaching materials. I still am teaching as an adjunct. So I really appreciated the content this morning morning. As I was thinking about this particular contribution today, I had a memory of being um, a new uh, kind of intern with my 7-Eleven license here in Chicago, um, learning about case management on the ground. Um, and my first experience at the Daily Center, learning um, on the 8th and 12th floor, how to obtain records, how to to uh, figure out the filing procedures um, in my guardianship case for a disabled adult. So I think that really rings true for a lot of the students that we are educating uh, because it can, it's easy to get overwhelmed by the sheer mass of information. And I try to always remind myself of that because the tools are only burgeoning for case management and the number of documents can be um, just, the breadth of documents is huge. Um, so I try to keep that in mind as I'm teaching externs here at the court. 
So a brief agenda for my thoughts. Um, obviously, everyone here, it matters in a great way because we're educators. Um, but I think case management is evolving. Uh, we need to reflect as a group. So I think um, either through AALS or AALL, perhaps um, even an advisory board of or council of sorts uh, might be necessary just to touch base more often um, about some of the tech uh, tools and tricks that we're using because um, it's shifting sand. I think uh, as I was preparing for this, my daughter's hamster got loose in her playroom. And that was such wonderful imagery for what we're going through. I think last year, uh, we were all just scurrying to keep up um, as we were creating videos and uh, teaching tech management and even this past spring with cybersecurity and that huge realm, um, which Emily did a great job of uh, educating us on all the core concepts. I think even with ransomware now, we're seeing that this is, again, a huge concern for companies, for, for teaching our law students um, to be effective in case management uh, tools and encryption. So it does matter. Um, we, we as legal educators, I feel, could more consciously prepare curricula. So um, I think each of the topics this morning, AI, e-discovery, um, certainly cybersecurity norms, it's all vital. It's all vital to uh, teaching effective practice of law and ethical practice of law going forward because it's only going to get more complex um, as a universe of data. Uh, one thing we're doing in the court, which perhaps is a, a unique contribution of mine today, is that we're embarking on civics education, uh, thinking more holistically about preparing uh, even from youth up to lifelong learners, uh, kind of creating programming and outreach uh, to high school teachers so that, you know, high school students have a better grounding in just basic civics and the branches of government. And then they come prepared to hopefully college with those skills and then it will blossom from there into law school. So I think uh, there are ways that poverty impact um, our students as well, and I'm sure you've seen that when teaching in the digital age now. You know, I had students trying to work from Wi-Fi in a McDonald's parking lot. So you have to think also of meeting your students where they're working. How can we arm them and create open access to materials? And I think as we see pro se patrons in the court, we want to make sure that there's that access us there to all of the case file and all of the documents. So obviously we're a common law system. Um, this is a huge component that we create baby steps in law school of teaching. Again, a refresher of uh, our branches of government, the civic system, and then going from there. And that's why I think collaborating with legal writing faculty is imperative. I have such utmost respect from all the schools I've worked at, at the sheer volume of, you know, work that a legal writing faculty member has. And I think collaborating with them to create meaningful uh, work and, and really simulation for students and learning the, the kind of universe of the case documentation is really effective. So I'll share some of those thoughts later in the presentation. I also, in the last five or six years, um, 
have really researched heavily Rule 1.1. So what are the ethical concerns now with technological competence? How can we achieve that in the context of digital literacy and uh, technology tools that are available today? Um, some of the speakers already mentioned a lot of the concerns like cybersecurity, encryption, cloud computing, but all of these intersect practice and how do we create efficiency when we have all these competing concerns? I think it's easy for a law student to kind of everything bleeds together. You don't always distinguish all of these unique components of the practice of law. So I like to start small in my courses. Um, and in the first year, it's very basic, as you'll see from a first year exercise that I'll share here at the end. But um, I think because there are so many containers, it's hard to distinguish between the case law sources. Um, that means the filings, the orders, the cases, sometimes they all come up when you use the smart search, the algorithms and Bloomberg, Westlaw and Lexis. Um, because that's an online landscape that's changing, you know, the recipe behind the algorithm is changing. Um, I think it's important to, at the outset each term, think about a digital literacy plan and for my particular component today, thinking about how will I infuse case management into my plan? Um, and I've taught a variety of sources, so I'll share some of the experiences I've had just building in some unique simulations um, to in IBT, for example, or in a 1L course or in a seminar on law and technology and practice. So this really intersects rule 1.1, 1.6 for confidentiality. Um, and I'll have a few ideas of what to teach, but these are by no means exhaustive. And they, I know I experimented a lot, like when I started at NIU in 2015, and then I kept tweaking, right? Because it doesn't always work um, in every setting. You need to keep evolving as the technology evolves. Um, also, I think there's a good conversation to be had between court librarians and academe for possibly expanding civics education, doing programming, having more conversations about what problems we're seeing, what deficiencies we're seeing. Because right now, for example, across the nation, there are hundreds of externs in federal courts. And I kind of view that as an apprenticeship of sorts um, because they're learning on the ground about the case filings, about the universe of uh, the case documentation. So I think the ethical implications, I just wanted to give a background um, of what I've been teaching uh, in my legal technology and practice course. I I looked at ABA statistics. I kind of informed myself based on how others were teaching their courses um, in specifically case management tools that were being used, um, which I'll elaborate on more later. But some interesting statistics from the ABA Legal Tech report is that most attorneys, a majority are using cloud-based services a lot are using over half now probably in the most recent report are using legal analytics and in response to Emily's comments on cybersecurity, um, at least a fourth have experienced a security breach. So that's quite high. And then when they asked further, do you know, you know, do you have knowledge of your third party providers and where they're storing information if it's encrypted? Many attorneys said, I don't know. 
month. So that also is alarming. Um, and only more recently have attorneys started using um, emergency planning or incidents plans. So I think we'll continue to see an uptick in those statistics, but um, I think it is important to reflect on that and, and use the statistics to teach our students. Um, Suskind did, I think this book is now probably post pandemic, not as revolutionary, right, with our landscape this last year, but it really challenged lawyers, I think, to think and embrace technology because of the efficiencies to be had. How could, you know, students becoming lawyers use tech more efficiently? use and understand AI driven tools, think about technology in the practice of law. Um, and I think, like Emily was saying, I have the experience that my students weren't as tech savvy as I expected. Uh, we talk a lot about digital lawyers, millennials who grew up with the technology, but I think they're not asking the why as much as um, we expected. Um, and I think that will continue and we need to challenge students and new lawyers to think um, comprehensively about the universe. Um, I just had a question this week about um, a petition for a review, a PFR, you know, from the Illinois Supreme Court and how to find that order because that's essential as a piece to the Seventh Circuit and many other, you know, circuits have similar appeals, rules. That's why I asked earlier about how can we think about how to work with civil procedure courses and teach doctrine intermixed with a simulation about how operationally um, gathering the case file works in practice. So what does rule 1.1 require? Um, so a lawyer now, in, has to provide competent representation, obviously. But in addition to that, the comment requires um, knowledge of the benefits and risks associated with that technology. So um, we've been grappling with this standard, I think, nationally and looking and seeing, you know, what would be a violation of this standard? What should we be teaching? Um, there have been many articles written now on this. Um, so we've already talked about some of these issues um, and this morning, which I think is great. And then I'm going to touch upon uh, the element of case management. And I think the ABA does a really good job at collating um, the tools. So you can always use that as a resource through the ABA Legal Tech Center and the buyer's guide to the tools for case management and practice management. But I think just to dissect this a little further, I think there are two issues in this realm. There's both case management as well as knowledge management as we know it. When I was talking to some law firm librarians um, on Zoom recently, they were saying how KM is still, you know, just burgeoning in law firms and how do we manage that? But I think in the judicial setting, you know, it's more the case file and teaching students how to effectively record the, you know, communicate the record as well as um, store it in a safe manner because there's a lot of confidential information. There was some helpful guidance through the ABA. Um, I'm sure many of you saw that formal opinion just to take reasonable efforts uh, to store and prevent that inadvertent access to information. So I wanted to touch upon that, but also the ethical uh, rules, rule 1.6 works in tandem with rule 1.1 because of that duty of confidentiality for case information um, and knowing the available systems that effectively do so. So often when I'm teaching, I'll talk about the tools in Bloomberg, the tools in Westlaw. I'll have an assignment that requires communication in a confidential manner of the case file. And I'll often collaborate with legal writing faculty to, to create connections um, with that communication and make sure that you're evaluating the communication 
communication and making sure that it's professional. Um, I think that's another important piece of that case management education. So in a study that I did, I kind of teased out all of the technological skill competencies. Obviously today, what I'm speaking to are the digital documents. We need to teach students basic digital document management. We need to make sure that they are armed and prepared to go out into practice, whether that's a solo practice, whether it's a mid-sized small firm or a large law firm using what's available um, in the digital realm for their case file. Um, and being able to find all of the orders, the petitions, all the motion practice that goes along with that. Um, I think that's where the educational piece and comprehension kind of erodes in my experience is that they're very savvy with finding legal opinions, but they may not know all the pieces that led up to the judicial opinions themselves. Um, finally, just making sure they're using those modern communication methods, making sure they know the basics of encryption, like others were saying, encrypted email, using a tool, encrypted tool, and I'll show Clio the simulation that I used um, in class, as well as uh, with our clinics at NIU, making sure they're using a secure platform with at least, you know, 256-bit encryption. So, the outcomes that I strive towards when I'm teaching are just teaching the effective documents, records, management tools, making sure they know how to encrypt. Um, I know a lot of schools have imp implemented Procertus and other tools, LTC4, for teaching students now and having a formalized education um, on those basics. Um, and when I come into my seminar, it's still staggering to see how many students don't know how to encrypt a document or haven't thought about it or haven't thought about security at all um, prior to that conversation. And finally, just modeling best practices. So when I'm out and about I have my elevator speech with professors or talking with others in my new job just about, you know, what are best practices for security um, and managing your case file. So I think that's important to think about consciously in your professional life as well. Um, I did research a lot in the last five or six years, the state ethics opinions um, and the technology competent standards. And then I also had a librarian look at the fruits nationally, looking at other law schools, um, what are the fruits of using uh, Clio as a tool versus other tools like my case or other uh, products out there. But really Clio, I think, is one of the most intuitive. So that's the one that we ultimately adopted at NIU. And we had a conversation with the clinic because they hadn't been using uh, uh, any tools really for digital case management. So this was a very nice synergy between the library and the clinics in the sense that we would be teaching in the 1L curriculum at the tail end, as well as in my law practice management course at the time, uh, making sure the students knew how to use Clio and then they were prepared for their summer work with the clinics. Um, beyond that, also doing exercises and foldering or note taking, uh, making sure they could draft professional emails. I even had um, in better times pre pandemic I had groups come to my office and present the research so that I would have their case file and I'd see, you know, I'd question them about why this case and not this case, which is more of a simulation of presenting in practice. So I think that worked well. Obviously, some semesters were better than others, but um, I think it's good to have them think about that in the first year prior to entering the workforce in the summer. Um, for Bloomberg Law, I also would 
teach the transactional tools because some of them may go into corporate practice, uh, thinking about um, also the differences between PACER and the CMECF for court filings and showing the differences and distinguishing. I think that's really important uh, for the breadth of the court case file. And then I wanted to just lastly reflect, um, I know I'm at 22 minutes here, but um, on some of my ideas of teaching, and these are by no means comprehensive, but I think the clinics do work well. Um, in my 1L class, uh, legal research class, I would do a simulation at the end in a group project. So having them keep time and just becoming familiar with that process for the billable hour, I think is really, um, it, it really is eye opening. You can see them change their habits and it really reinforces the need for uh, efficiency with finding cases and then creating that digital case file. So I'll show you the rubric I use because if it's graded, there's more incentive than to be conscientious. And then I also created videos for how to use Clio. So that reinforced prior to doing the exercise, they could always ask me questions about using Clio as well. In my international human rights course and international business course, I would show a complicated case with case files like the Unical case um, and show them the documentary, which is obviously heartbreaking called total denial with the building of that pipeline in Myanmar. So really using case studies, real life examples, even if the case is subtle, I think it shows you the diversity of the case file, um, which they learn from and they can see the lifeline of the case. And then now I think it's really beneficial uh, to see the apprenticeship model. So really a clerkship for a federal judge is really an apprenticeship of sorts. And you learn such a, a great wealth of material, obviously, just from being on the ground and working with the clerk's office. Um, so I would really encourage those experiences for law students. So this is just my rudimentary basic, very basic. These are 1Ls. I give hypotheticals. Um, they have to research them. They have time constraints. Um, and so for the practice groups, I do have them manage their uh, time in Clio. So they all are expected to review the videos, um, keep their time, and then communicate that to me, which in Clio, um, obviously, they'd create a client matter and communicate through that uh, product. And then a rubric now through the case management system, you can just have your rubric there. Um, this is an older one, but through Blackboard Ultra or Canvas, I would create um, kind of a point breakdown so that Clio is graded for that basic exercise. And I did get good feedback. I think perhaps some groups understood Clio better than others, but at least it's a first practice round simulation for them of timekeeping and management. So I create, um, I created this back in 2015. So there's a whole, you know, archive of files for my law office for Keel Law. Um, and then they'd keep a time entry. I do this for my law practice management course as well. They have client matters. They learn about how to name them, how to group and bill. Um, so I think it's a really effective way for them in a case management context to see how to first organize all of the information uh, for case management for a client, client. And I just made up fictitious contacts and then I have them add their contact and then I have them bill. So they communicate the bill to me I list them all as basic associate, oh, associates through the settings. And then I have an IOLTA account as well as a, so they transfer funds uh, basically. So it's a real simple way for them to get their feet wet um, and then make those payments and get a sense, especially if they're going into solo practice, they get a little bit of exposure to that process of 
law practice management um, as a business. And then they also are required to communicate with me um, through Clio specifically. So it's, I think, a really helpful way as a group. They do it in small groups of two or three to then communicate um, their time, their billings. Um, and Clio, if you haven't used it, is a really user-friendly tool. I've actually had former students come back and tell me that they implemented their own plan in their small law firms because they hadn't thought of, you know, creating a virtual repository of the case files. So I've that's been neat to hear that feedback um, in practice at the smaller solo uh, law firms and small to medium where they just had all these case files, you know, you can envision them as they used to be on the floor or in a cabinet. Um, so that's really one, one of the things we love as being professors is to get that feedback. And just thinking future in the future, I guess, where should we go from here? Um, I think really the simulation practice i've found to be the most effective but i know there are many other ways to do it but i think i find students get overwhelmed quickly so finding good exercises and perhaps sharing uh, uh, case studies that work well i think as educators would be really helpful going forward and having more conversations because i know nationally a lot of folks are doing this case management simulation but i think we are better together so um working with IT staff, working with law librarians, working with professors that who do, you know, the cryptocurrency and tech. Um, I think when we share ideas more, we're going to get stronger and do a better job. So I would welcome those conversations and perhaps maybe a tech ed working group um, at one of our national associations. And I experiment a lot. I some of my colleagues at NIU probably thought too much and they really helped me out in my endeavor. So thank you, Therese clark Arado and Matt Timko, who were constantly giving me feedback and I appreciated that. And I think just identifying for students the due diligence and the duties under the ethical standards going forward um, is imperative. And I think also conversations in the court, specifically with clerk's office, offices um, and uh, really the world's our oyster with educational programming I think um, and creating access to those court records going forward with the the technologies that are available so I think I'll stop there I could talk about this and have a conversation for several hours but I will stop there because I know I see a few questions already thank, thank you, you. Thank you very much, Heidi. That was great. And uh, uh, I, 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 you're right. There are some questions. Uh, SJ, you want to get going on those questions? We're going to go uh, for another three minutes on the questions, and we won't get to them all, but we have a time when we close to ask more questions. So we want to keep those in the in the cash, if you will, SJ. But if you could ask uh, the questions there. An anonymous attendee has asked, will you please share your slides? I teach an ethical component of advanced legal research and really like your examples. I think students would be interested in learning more about this aspect of technology and legal practice. So would you, would you sure, share Sure, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Thank yeah. you. Send those to me and I'll disseminate uh, okay. that, uh, Heidi. Uh, next question. Paul Callister asked, when you talk about encrypted communications, do you mean encrypted email, which requires an identity certificate, or encrypting the attached files, or using a secure cloud for sharing, a cloud site for sharing, sorry. Yeah. Um, all of the above, actually, Paul. I teach each of those um, types. So, and I walk them through it, and then they do it, and practice. So I think those are all important skill sets. Great. Uh, Heidi, I have a question to, for you too, but I'm going to leave that for the end and pull it out at that point. But I wanted to 
Uh, thank you very much. I wanted to get to our next speaker, Roger Skullback, Professor of Law and Associate Dean of, uh, oh, Heidi, could you please, there you go. Uh, <laughs> professor of Law and Associate Dean for Library and Information Services at the Richmond School of Law. Uh, Roger's going to be uh, talking about teaching tech competency in law school. Roger. Can you hear me now? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Um, so this has been great. Uh, Emily, Bob, Joe, Kevin, and Heidi, thanks for wonderful um, presentations. we got great content here. I can't wait to... Uh, go back to it, get some inspiration. And uh, thanks to Eric, SJ, and Martin for helping keep the trains running on time and, and keeping us as panelists uh, in check and on the, on the right page here. Um, I'm gonna share my slides here in a second and hopefully leave time at the end because I wanna make sure we get questions that um, were there for Heidi. And then I'm, I'm hoping that some of what I present inspires both questions and reactions for examples that others can share as well. So. Let's get into it. Everybody see the slides okay here? Perfect. All right. So um, tech, teaching technology competency. Um, that's what we're talking about here today. And um, what I'm going to do is present this in a framework of four things, um, models, methods, modules, and motivation. I tend to like sort of mnemonics and alliteration just to sort of frame things here. Um, there's some variation on this, and, and you'll see some themes that we saw come up as topics in some of the other areas. So I wanna kind of walk through this and, and explore what I've seen, what I've done, and what I've uh, seen others doing. Um, and as a result of this also, try to inspire every single person who's here today who teaches a class that's not a technology class to think about how you could incorporate technology into your class to start sort of raising the bar or sort of you know rising the tide here as to how people understand and actually effectively apply technology. So that's where we're gonna head, end up with lots of time for questions when it's all done. So why technology competence? You know, the obvious answer, uh, Joe mentioned this, we heard this from Heidi and I think others, is that um, there's a model um, rule comment that expects that we do this. This is a great map from Bob Ambrosi at the Law Sites website, where he has been tracking this uh, pretty much every year since people started adopting this. It was 11, 12, 13, et cetera, et cetera. And we see in this map all of the states where uh, technology competence is adopted, this particular thing. There's a variation on that. The nice thing about his site is you can click through to see specifically when, where, and how it was adopted in your jurisdiction. I want to add a variation to this map, which is that here's a map of every state in which technology competence matters. Even if you're in Georgia or Oregon or Hawaii where they haven't yet adopted the model rule, if you're practicing law there, you gotta be competent. And, and why is that? Well, a couple of things. The first sort of most obvious things that we think about in terms of us teaching a profession is that what you're gonna to wanna to do as a result of this is um, be able to manage your time and make money. And if you're able to manage your time and make money well, you know what you're gonna do is you're gonna result in probably being a little bit happier about things, probably being a little bit more satisfied with life and just being more effective at how you uh, both communicate and um, practice law and just interact with um, society and, and the work that you do as an attorney. So tech competence has these core requirements that they sort of ABA um, a professional responsibility level, but even more fundamentally, um, being effective with technology means that you can be a little bit more control in, in both your destiny and also, um, but, you know, your bottom line. Um, so let's look at some models for teaching tech competency, look to see how some folks have done this at a variety of schools, and then delve a little bit more into um, some of the nuts and bolts of what it means to teach a class and what goes into it and the, the inputs and the outputs as well. So First of all, just to, to think of this sort of broadly is um, the first thing that somebody might do is approach this to say, well, what I wanna do is have a standalone class in technology. We heard some examples of that that Heidi had done. I think there's others here who have done variations of this. I have names of several courses here that you might see in an academic, an academic catalog or you might have uh, taught yourself. 
turns out all of these are actual real classes. And if you go to this site that um, John Mayer from Cali has put together, you can find the syllabus for every single one of these classes and the name of the person who's taught every single one of these classes. I'm borrowing some of the content from these classes to sort of highlight a few points here um, without attribution. So it's sort of taken a, a level away, but not trying to take away from them, but more trying to say there are great sources in terms of the syllabus and resources in terms of the people that are putting this together. A brief aside on that collection is that um, it also includes things such as syllabus for e-discovery classes, privacy classes, coding for the law, and other things like that. So my focus is a little bit more narrow on tech competence, which is why I pulled these out. But uh, if you go to that collection, you can find things more broadly. If you teach a class, send them over to John Mayer at Cali, and he'll put it on the list and share your news with others. So that's, that's what you can see there. Um, in terms of classes taught at law schools, we always are required or at least expected from the ABA to identify and tell to students what the learning outcomes are. You started this class, it's one to three credits long, it's focused very specifically on, on law office technology, what are you going to get out of it? So I'll show here a couple of examples of, again, things borrowed from uh, the syllabi posted at this collection, just to get us a sense of like, how might students frame what they're experiencing and how would you as a professor um, teaching a class like this uh, approach it to understand that your intention is matching the uh, activities that students are undertaking here for this. So this one, I won't read everything in detail here, but you see some of the language here is possess a basic knowledge. So competence isn't mastery, competence is you know, you're pretty good at, you understand the basics, you understand the, the, the pluses and minuses, right? Develop the knowledge, possess the skills, identify and become familiar with electronic communication and have a basic understanding of coding, website creation and design. So it gives you a sense of kind of in this course, the, the range of things that a student might uh, experience and that a professor would expect to happen in the classroom and out of classroom learning. Another one here um, is, um, a sort of variation on this. this. This is from, I think this is Dennis Kennedy, but again, it could be from any of these. Um, looking at this to see, you know, the major technologies used in the practice of law. We heard um, uh, Heidi mention a bunch of these for her presentation. And then this one focuses on, especially in the law, large law firm and corporate law setting, but also areas of access to justice. So I think in putting together the learning outcomes, it's, it's useful to understand who is my audience? Is it, do I, are my students more likely to be um, going into solo and small firm practice? Do I have a number of them going to bigger firms? And also in putting it together and signaling to students, why would I take this class? This is a good um, place to sort of frame things as to what's being done. The last thing on these learning outcomes that I'll say that I really, really like here is that this particular um, syllabus includes a description that what they're trying to do is have the students understand what the clients expect out of this. So it's not just like, do you know Word or PowerPoint or Adobe or Excel or something like that? It says, why does this client matter? What, what do they care about? What is the position that they're going to be in? The second point here that is a learning outcome that I really like from this as well is use knowledge about this uh, in practical simulations that will enhance your paths to leadership. So enhance the path to leadership. This is fascinating. I've heard from at least three people um, stories of success at a law firm where knowledge of creating pivot tables or knowledge of managing data in Excel led to opportunities that they would not have had absent that. So you have to you know, be able to manage some data. You have to be able to pull things together and do simple analysis. This isn't high level stuff. But you know, I've heard from these people who said they looked around, I could do a pivot table. I was then in a position of leadership, or at least leading into an area where I was more influential in terms of the business and practice of what goes on at that particular law firm. So then the next thing we turn to is, okay, we've got this. We kind of know generally where we're going to go, but where are students going to spend their time? You've got typically a 13 or 14 week semester, one to three credits is sort of the general range. Well, where do people spend their time and, and how much effort is put into each particular task? Here's three examples of ways that um, 
uh, people have approached this, and, and I'll touch a little bit on, on, on elements of especially the legal technology audit here in a second. Uh, but we see here, there's a nice thing, because this uh, first one on the left is, is more of a survey, we're looking at, well, we're going to spend 10% you know, on document automation, we're blog management, we're going to do a judge profile, uh, e-discovery. So it's not deep into any of these particular areas, but it gives you, as that learning outcome expected, a general understanding of what this technology does and why it's useful. And that meets the requirement of 1.1's um, model um, uh, comment. The other couple of things we'll see there is one of these classes says, you know, 40% of the grade is the legal tech assessment. So this is somebody that's requiring mastery and expecting deep contributions uh, and, and time spent in learning all of these things. It's not watching some videos, it's actually going through the paces of all of the steps that Proceritus or something like that requires. And then NSLT, we'll see that in a second. It's just another variation of something that provides access to core legal technology tools to get this, um, this degree of competence. <clears throat> Final thing here, you know, you might approach this. I know Heidi mentioned that she likes to add points to things and, and provide a rubric and things because that tends to spur um, a, a sort of a sort of drive from students. And there's also maybe more sort of incentive to, to achieve things. Well, if you have more of a collaborative model and what you want to do is, is relax a little bit of the, of the curve or, or the grade impact and do it pass fail, this is a nice approach to do it in a way that still requires people to do a lot of stuff. If you look at the final point here, half of the grade is um, an individual draft. So you have an individual contribution to something and then contribution to a big presentation. If you don't show up for the presentation, you don't pass the class. If you don't turn in these things and do some of these other things, you don't pass the class. But you know, you might pass high marks, low marks, and you all get the same thing. But I think it's a nice way to think about how you might approach this in a way that uh, kind of uh, levels the playing field, but still raises the bar, at least in terms of people being expected to uh, contribute things. The next thing when you're, you're thinking about a course that you're putting together, or you're sort of pitching it for you know, maybe your uh, associate dean or, or sort of a, a, a collaborator is, you know, how much of stuff do I want to do? Is what I'm doing um, more of a survey course or more of sort of a buffet or smorgasbord style thing? We saw that one course where the, um, the assessment was 10%, 10%, 10%, 15, 15, 15. So you got a bunch of different subjects like that. I know Joe had mentioned that in his class, what he does is has a lot of guest speakers. So a lot of people come in and talk about a bunch of different things. So in that sort of model, you're getting a greater degree of exposure, but probably a lower degree of either mastery or um, kind of a true skill development in a sense. So you have to you know, ask yourself, do you want people to know about things or do you want people to do things or maybe a little bit of both? So I think it's useful to sort of think about as you're putting things together, which one of those you're um, approaching and also just signal to your students. You know what, you're not gonna get a lot of things, but you're gonna you know, go through several or half of your grade is this particular contribution of mastering these skills because that's valuable and that's what you're gonna get out of it if you uh, remain in the class and, and choose to take it and recommend it to others. So that's, that, that ends that. Let, let's talk a little bit about methods and some of the tools that go into this. I think some of you are familiar with this, so I won't go into um, great detail on, on all of the components. But um, one, um, one offering that's available is from the National Society for Legal Technology. Uh, what they provide is a really great breadth and catalog of the kinds of tools that are available in these eight um, sort of broad subject areas, e-discovery, document management, office tools, things like that. Um, they don't create all of the content themselves for every single one of these, but they have a great inventory of things. So you might go and say, well, I'm about to go to this firm and I wanna know about this and oh, these are the tools they use. If you had access to this, you could get sort of brand specific experience for certain things. What NSLT also does is similar to Proceritus, which we'll see in a second, is they have a certification program. There's just a little bit more watch videos, read materials, complete quizzes, sort of um, uh, do things that way, but they do have something that is specifically around 
prove that you've done a certain thing and you've, you've achieved a, a level of, of completion in a certain area. So it's, it's a good one to look at as, as a model that sometimes doesn't get as much um, press, but it's, it's a nice thing that has depth of catalog and, and breadth of content. The other one here, and if I had a little more time, I'd play you a video, but I'll post it in the chat when we get there. Um, we did a short video to promote this to our students. Uh, Procertus is the platform you've heard of. Um, Joe mentioned at the, at the top of the, today's program, Casey Flaherty put this together. It's been inherited since then. It is a very exacting and very detailed approach to learning these tools. As you saw from some of the examples of courses, some people say this is 40% of the effort. ABA says one credit is roughly between 45 and 50 hours of time. You might be spending 30 hours of your time completing these exercises. And at that point, you've got part of a credit. If you're teaching a one or two credit class, you have to decide how much time you're investing in students doing this. The outcome though, is that you actually could get mastery in something and, and a certification badge showing that you've done it for that reason. So here's some of the things that you might use sort of methods to teach, you know, specific software. And I want to highlight the thing about Procerdis and, and uh, NSLT that I think is, is interesting. Uh, the nice thing is this, this tends to be self-paced content. If you're trying to fit in a specialized course where you might do it, say, between the fall and the spring semester, you could do a bunch of the readings and the, and the sort of lecture and, and sort of exercise completion ahead of time simulation for one week and you can get 30 students in a classroom sort of for that period between semesters or sort of maybe um you know pre-semester kind of thing for that um just thinking of how you might structure it the other thing is that it's kind of nice you sort of get this like visceral sort of achievements are unlocked you know you're getting certification you're getting these things and sort of students get a sense of true accomplishment that has an outward signaling effect that's not just did I do a thing that got me a grade or a pass? It's a, did I do a thing that I can truly show my employer of the future as to what I did? Um, these couple of examples are nice because they tend to be pre-built with law examples versus going to something like LinkedIn Learning, um, the former Linda Learning platform, um, where it was like, learn Word, learn Excel, learn PowerPoint, with sort of generic things. Um, there's there. And a strong focus on core office tools, you know, the you know, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, things like that. Um, downside may be that it tends to sort of favor a little bit more product over process. You know, exactly how does Word execute a very specific set of protocols to do something to automatically number a thing? Um, again, time required, it's investing a lot of time if what you're saying is students have to get this level of mastery. Well, some students have to do the exercise three or four times in a row. So you have that concern. Unforgiving precision. Uh, I did the Procerdis thing and I found that I was really frustrated at certain things that I knew how to do a thing and it looked right to me, except it didn't match character for character. So I got it wrong. Um, so there's that. So that, that's sort of the model where you would say, I'm gonna teach a course called tech competency or some variation on that. Here's my um, pitch to everybody here who teaches a course that isn't that, or also teaches something else. I teach legal research and copyright primarily. I've taught tech competency and, and other kinds of courses um, in filling in, but that's kind of my core area right now. So I think that the great area of opportunity is in skills-based courses, your research, writing, clinics. There's great examples of what you can do there. The downside, you know, I've talked to some of my writing colleagues and research colleagues at other schools. The downside is your syllabus in your semester tends to be really, really packed with stuff. Your core purpose really consumes the class. Just to pull one out and, and I'll, I'll go on to the next slide. On the legal research side, which I know best, um, well, we need to learn the legal system. We need to learn the sources of law. We need to know how to do research methods. We need to learn all the platforms of Lexis and Westlaw and possibly Bloomberg and do it in 13 weeks for a single credit. Well, where's there room for technology? I'm gonna say, well, I can't do that. Why don't you take the you know, discovery and technology course? Similar experience might come up within legal writing or the clinics. However, I think you can make this happen. Here's an example of what I did pre-pandemic and then I pivoted a little during um, a virtual um, Zoom-based uh, class for legal research. Every class, what we do is I introduce a topic, 
I have people work on it together and report back. You know, the old teach, pair, and share uh, concept, whereas pairs here were larger groups. So I say, write down a response to the question or you know, question, go to the next question, do anything you want, spend 20 minutes, report back. Well, how is this technology? Well, what I did with this one is I leveraged the fact that our school has box at Office 365. And what I did is put all of these full files in a folder and gave people access to them and required them to actually interact with the content during class. So without them knowing it, what I'm doing is I'm introducing the concepts of collaboration and cloud computing, and they're all experiencing this from the get-go. A couple of colleagues were like, oh, I don't really shouldn't be introducing too many tools. This is kind of, you know, it's, it's a lot of work for people, cognitive load and so forth. Absolutely correct. However, I thought it was valuable enough to make it a requirement that students could use Word collaboratively online and use Box so that they could share files with each other and back stuff up in case their hard drives failed. And they had to just happen to do that in the, the context of the research class. So that's one there. This is how it would then look if we see here, these are the groups that I had for my fall 2020 research class. On the right there, where you see all of these different version numbers, these are the number of contributions that students made in this particular section in class during each of these um, six uh, weeks uh, lessons. So, you know, up to 29, 24, 19, 20 different variations. So true contributions happening together where people are collaborating together. You could do this in Google Drive or, or things like that as well. So module one, collaboration and, um, and uh, cloud computing. The other one um, that I've done that I think is a really good one is, is going sort of leaning into the concept of document automation. This is partly efficiency and it's also competency in terms of just like, how do you work efficiently and not just start with a blank sheet of paper when you're writing a transactional or, or litigation focused document. So here, what I do is I have a hypo where I want people to draft a non-compete agreement. And we talk about practical law. We could talk about the other version on, on a different form, but we tend to just focus on the, the, the concept of this. And we just start with Westlaw because it's easier. We can go to Lexis Bloomberg or something else like that as well. So we do that. Then what I have people do is I have people find an employee non-compete agreement and not just search it, but actually then fill it out and complete it. And then as they're filling it out and completing it, what I, what I want them to do is I want them to actually think about and, and sort of um, discuss within classes, okay, how might you operate, make this operational so that it, if you were doing instead of one for a simple class exercise, you're doing 20 or 30 of them for a group of employees you're hiring for a new thing. How do you make it scale? How do you automate this stuff so that you can pull things in from your, your intake form, your HR system, whatever? You might not have to know how to do it um, actually, but you'd start wanting to talk about how would this act, how, how might it work and how might you be mapping these things? So document automation is, is module two. Um, the other one that I've done, sort of a variation on this that I show people as they put it together is to um, look at the actual structure of the document. If you're using headings for the document and what you wanna do is decide that you're gonna reorder things. Well, we simply walk through in class and a good example of here, potentially I might want the restrictive covenants uh, ahead of the confidential information. This somewhat obscure thing that we're looking at here is the outline view in Word. If you have something structured around headings, you can make section A show up before B or what had been one show up now is two, three, or four. And you actually then start looking at that and start thinking about how does the document structure work? It's just part of your class. It's, you're already doing the, the sort of more heavy lift on the research side. And then this is just folding into it, the technology appreciation and understanding. Another one that I've done both in research and I think would work really well in writing is to work on something where you're looking at uh, formatting and headings. So this is a simple uh, outline view of a paper that I have students do in the spring semester. It could be a good writing example, you know, question presented, brief answer, analysis, conclusion, et cetera, where you have that structured as headings. And then what I do is I simply walk people through how to do an automatic table of contents. And that's a required element of the, of, of the particular thing that you're turning in so that it would show up something like this. Students that have seen that, they're like, wow, that's efficient. I'm never gonna do it the hard way again. 
And you know, seeing that in your first year of law school, knowing you'll have that sort of in your toolkit going into your first summer experience, I think is great. Um, then you can use it beyond that and in other ways as well. So writing module one, formatting and headings. The other one here, and then I wanted to throw something somewhat fun in terms of subject matter in here is um, document edits and review. Um, this takes a little bit more time in terms of the investment of the professor, but for certain exercises, what you can do is actually just use the commenting feature of Word, give it back to people and tell people instead of just looking at that and responding to actually use the track uh, changes feature and give you back some feedback or collaborate on that together as a group, things like that. So you want to do that in a way that you're sort of again, folding into the experience of a traditional skills class, what you have uh, for uh, that content. Last couple of things here in terms of modules and inspiration, I don't have specific examples that are as detailed on this, but you know, think about all of the other classes that are out there. You know, the obvious one and, and sort of the one that's already happening probably in, in every law school that, that does this, uh, Heidi had mentioned clinics, you've got practice management, you're doing model communications, you might be doing some things that are around document automation. Another thing there that I think, you know, is competence, it also sort of speaks to uh, an area that uh, uh, librarians especially would find core is, you know, maybe using iPads where what you're doing is using that for note taking, using it for cloud computer access. Uh, we do not allow our, our courts, rather in Virginia, don't allow our students to bring in cell phones or, or laptops, but they can bring iPads in. Well, they can bring in an iPad and then they have access to a variety of tools. And they also could have access to potentially the law, which is things like the uh, legal encyclopedias and court rules that you can use digitally downloaded from our subscription. And then not only are you tech competent to know that they work, but you show up with access to the stuff that you need to be an effective lawyer. Contracts, you can do automation, you can look at standards, you can do sort of contract analysis, and there might be a little bit more like guest lecture, just showing stuff off versus having an actual assignment. Um, uh, Heidi had mentioned as well, document encryption, metadata, that might just be something that says, okay, so when you submit this, I wanna make sure that the metadata shows that you're the author and that you didn't take it from somewhere else. Or when you submit this, I want to make sure that you've, you've uh, encrypted it, um, getting it put in. Last example that I've got, and I think my next slide is, is, is turning it back to, to us to, to get questions here, is one thing that I heard somebody do that I thought was a really good idea is simply just start every class with a tech tip. So, uh, you know, when students get in the class, they're sort of milling in, and whether it's into the Zoom room or into their seats and things like that to center the focus, instead of telling a joke or having a lighthearted thing or jumping into the day's assignment, what you might do is say, hey class, let me show you how you can easily sort data in Excel. I've got this long list of 100 things and I wanna find out how many of them meet this criteria. Three steps, five minutes, you've piqued their interest, you move on. You're not requiring that they appreciate it, but you're requiring that they understand the potential so that they could then follow up and say, hey, can you show me that again? Can you do that again for me? So that's, a, that's a, the last thing that I've got there. Ah, motivation. So motivation here, um, we always see in terms of legal design, we have this framework, which is people process technology. Technology competence, all of the things that I've sort of been talking about here are that third element to them. But we also know that there's a process involved in terms of getting, there's people involved in terms of doing this. This is why technology competence is really best pursued in context, whether it's simulation or it's just legal specific examples. It really gets the sort of better connection to comprehension. Um, and also I think that efficiency can be experienced. Hand out to people documents that are auto numbered to half of the, the class and not auto numbered to the other half of the class and simply give them the exercise that says, let's rearrange this and make sure that it's structured correctly. And as soon as you're done, you can leave. Well, half of the class is going to struggle and, and, and have to spend a lot of extra time on it. The other half will be, wow, that was easy. And you really appreciate, wow, there, there's a reason that I should know this stuff. And I want to learn more because it's going to, again, possibly save me time, probably save me money, and likely make me a little bit happier. So that's what we've got there. Last thing you might do is, is during job seeking season, show people how to do a mail merge 
or the, the thing that was the most popular that seemed obvious to me, which is show people how to do a digital signature, which is not digitally signing things with encrypted format. It's writing your name on a piece of paper, taking a picture of it and having it so that when you submit a document electronically, um, it's like PDF or Word or something like that, it looks as if you signed it without having to scan it. It's a real simple thing there. That's all I've got. I'm going to stop sharing. I think I may have gone a couple minutes over, but I'm really excited to hear from everybody. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. I can't wait for more questions. Thank you very much, Roger. I thought uh, a very good presentation. Um, I don't see any questions and answers right now, but uh, I do want to, and you probably know this because I know you scour the area, but are you aware of a new University of New Hampshire Law Review? Uh, by Dwayne O'Leary, a professor from Suffolk, uh, smart lawyering, integrating technology competence into the legal practice curriculum. It's a really good article, and I strongly recommend it. So uh, you might want to note that. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It's at, um, I pulled it up from SSRM, but actually it already has a site, uh, 19. University of New Hampshire, NHL, number two, uh, page 197 starts. Um, very good. Um, you know, uh, I have a question for you, Roger. I mean, I, I have pro in my law practice technology class. And, uh, you know, I, I agree with you. After students see it and they start recognizing what it is and how it's helping them, they do get motivated. Uh, at first, though, it's like pulling teeth. Uh, there are some that actually are kind of tech competent very much, and like three in the class, we just go to it and get it done. But what do you do? I mean, uh, how do you approach your students? This is more for us teaching, right? And which is a large share of us today. What's your motivators? Um, I, I think my, my motivators are, it's a little bit like, um, I used to coach, uh, you know, soccer for really, really young kids. <laughs> Call out the good performers. Say, ah. wow, you did a really great job. I'm really excited about that. Whoa, you know, I can't believe you scored that goal or you kicked the ball down or, wow, that was a really well executed, you know, outline yeah. you to your document. Yeah. And so it's sort of like rewarding and recognizing good behavior. Right. So it's, it's less about, you know, who are the laggards? Um, the, yeah. the other motivator, of course, is, is, is points or grades. Ah. Right. You know, like, like I gave the example of... Um, I now require a um, automatically generated table of contents on the longer document I give. And it's, it's like two or three or four points, but it's, you know, why not do it? And yeah. a couple of people don't, I'm like, they say, why well, wasn't my grade perfect? I said, well, you didn't do the simplest. Let me show you how much effort it took. Like, oh yeah, I didn't feel like it. So yeah, right. I, I think yeah. recognition and, and rewards are a sense. Yeah, that, that sounds good. You sound like my high school basketball coach who I would never get any of those accolades, but there was one guy on our, our team who went to Clay College Ball and was a starter as soon as he was a freshman. Great basketball player, but he was really the only guy he praised. So after a while, even that guy got disliked. But I know what you mean. I know what yeah. you mean. You got to, <laughs> you usually have in law school, you have several who are doing quite well. Um, the points thing is interesting because. Um, I give points in my class too. I didn't think anything. And the students rebelled. They were comparing points with each other. Um, and so I, I modified it to a check. Uh, no, a check minus a check and a check plus. And they, for some reason, dumb reason, I have no, they're okay with it. So yeah. uh, it was a transformation I made. Uh, Actually, that was suggested to me by a master's in education that was taking my class, who I got to know quite well. It was very, uh, so I said, hey, Jack, what can I do? He says, I know exactly what you should do. Anyway, um, we do have a question, a question, Sarah Jean. We have a question. Don't we? Uh, Paul Jang would like to know, this isn't for a specific this isn't for a specific panelist, but any thoughts on any particular remote distance learning methods when it comes to teaching legal technology? I'm sorry, any remote distance teaching methods when it comes to oh. teaching legal technology? 
Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in briefly and anybody on the call, feel free to, to add to this. Um, uh, you know, I found um, teaching on Zoom, which was basically teaching remotely, um, that breakout rooms where we required students to use the tools together worked really well. And also I thought that it, it worked really well for um, me to be able to, to observe sort of globally what's happening and then focus in each room as to what's going on within it. The, the caveat there is this works okay with normal office technology. I don't know how well it scales to say e-discovery tools or you know case management or other things like that. Yeah, I, I like to build on that. Um, it was very difficult for us. We did do it with a lot of hiccups. Um, we found that I was encouraging the students to get together and zoom in for the groups because different places there was issues regarding a student who's in the law school, students who, who is at home, a student that's five states away. I don't ask me why, but the Zoom grouping uh, didn't work uh, that well for that, but we got through it um, with, with a good help of our IT uh, committee. But uh, no, I, I, I agree, groups are great. Uh, and um, you know, I think they're getting the bugs out of that, at least for Zoom. Kevin, did you have something? I saw you unmuted. Uh, yes, um, at uh, Pitt, they've adopted uh, Canvas and uh, the interface between Canvas and Zoom is uh, pretty uh, convenient to use. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, my uh, co-instructor, Yaramir Savelka, um, uh, I mentioned before, stepped students through various uh, programming exercises uh, and used um, screen share uh, with the um, uh, collabs. Uh, and uh, it, it actually turned out to be quite an effective way of uh, showing them uh, without losing them. Um, so I, I think that uh, if you happen to have Canvas and, and Zoom, it, it works quite well in that respect. Yeah, uh, very good. Uh, go ahead. One other, yeah, one other thing um, on this sort of remote access and remote kind of use of things, sort of a variation on this question, but we did during the pandemic, we had to close our computer lab. Um, but what we did is we enabled um, a number, I think three or four of our computers for remote desktop access, specifically because what, what did people do there? Well, they would stop inconveniently to print stuff, but also they have, we have the professional version of Adobe Acrobat. You can get various sort of cheaper versions of it, but if we're advising people on sort of top grade tools, if you can get to those without having to buy a license and using shared access, it really works well. Um, so there's some licensing and sort of technical hurdles there, but I thought that was really useful. And we'll actually keep doing that even when we're fully in person and have a lab that's open. Yeah, good. Um, I haven't been keeping track of any possible questions. I'm going to pop back to you, Heidi, if you don't have it. Thank you very much, Roger. That was very good. Heidi, I'm going to pack it back to you. And I have a question about... Um, the case management, um, case management software. And, you know, interestingly enough, um, for whatever reasons, I think the big reason is it's not all that popular with attorneys. And you probably know where I'm going to go. The fact that you can have that software and you don't use 95% of it. Uh, you know, why do we pay this type of money when we're using two things? And, and I do think there's been some um, effort on companies to, you know, they created these things. I, I got sort of, it's sort of a pet peeve on, on my part. They created these software systems without even questioning the customers. I mean, they, they figured it out in their group behind some door that these are what lawyers really want. Well, they got it wrong. And, you know, if there's minimal solutions they can use, maybe just come up with their own solution. 
maybe just not get those softwares. And I guess that's ultimately how it's going to be. If, if you're not selling your product, you've got to figure out how to make it better. Mm -hmm. What's your thinking on that? Yeah, that's a great, great insight. I think at least through user experience and future, hopefully user studies, they'll glean that exact point. But I've seen more recently, they offer a tiered service. So there's different options in your subscription, at least through yeah. some of the case management tools. So that's at least an enhancement. Um, but at the very least, I think we can teach our students the timekeeping aspect. There's very inexpensive timekeepers. Um, and I know there was a challenge uh, 20 years ago, for example, of being frustrated with Westlaw and Lexus for not having a timekeeping tool. But I think right. there are easy workarounds for that now. Right. So at least we can challenge our students that way. And also with just labeling and basic intuitive solutions, um, how to preserve confidentiality and not name things with the exact names, the personally identifiable information, which is a big concern, use case numbers or some other uh, data and that's a simple, just like I liked Roger's, you know, quick tech tick tip at the beginning of class. You know, these are just yeah. useful tips for practice that you can um, share and impart to students. Definitely. And I should just say my attribution should go to the Legal Technology Survey Report, which is my Bible. Um, I get it. It's just a great place to just pull out statistics and find out what attorneys are thinking about various software. So I strongly recommend if you're doing any teaching in tech, get that. It's not cheap, but uh, it's worth uh, tell your director, you got to get it. And, you know, we do. Uh, any other questions out there at this point? Um, for any of us, we've come to the last stage. It's the closing part of our program today. Um, if any uh, questions, just shoot them out there. I want to thank uh, Martin, Martin Rask, uh, Eric Siller, Sarah Jean Pettit, uh, for everybody that's tuned in here. I also want to help uh, thank uh, Bob Fernier, uh, Kevin Ashley, Emily M. Janowski. Hey, uh, uh, who, who am I saying? Harley? No, I got that wrong. Who, does, who did she say? I got it. Her last name is the same as... It's like Van Halen. 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 And see, I already forgot it. How can I do that? I was calling her Harley. Anyway, uh, Heidi, cool. And Roger Skelback. And also thanks to the sponsors for this event. Uh, Malco, uh, very important. Uh, couldn't do it without Malco and our own law library. Um, but we did, of course, take the power of the broader power of the law school um, uh, logo and all that. So the deans were very happy that that was getting out there. Uh, I want to thank everybody at this point. Uh, anybody else uh, want to say anything before we call the day and you guys can have lunch? <laughs> Thumbs up. All right. Thank you, everybody. It's been great having you today. I hope maybe you can tune in for the same program day two is going to be more toward the practice bent, but we also also have academics here, so uh, it should cover everybody. Thank you very much. I hope you got everybody has a great day. Bye bye.